There are times in my life when I have been so filled with my own perceived suffering that I want to lay down and be done with life itself. I have felt picked on, ignored, fearful. I have suffered gossip and rejection. And maybe you have experienced some of those things too. In fact, we have a phrase that we say in our frustration when we feel like we just can't take any more suffering. Just shoot me. Elijah was feeling like that in our story from 1 Kings. God, I've done all these things for you. I've, I've showed off your strength. I've been faithful to you. And now the queen has threatened to kill me. Just let me die. And with a bit of defiance and a bit of resignation, he plops down under a tree and wishes for death. And what does God give to him? He gives revival. <clears throat> he discovers that some food and some rest will give him through this. He is cared for in the midst of his suffering. The blessings that are his will see him through. The psalmist knows of suffering as well. Longing for implies more than I want. It implies that deep yearning, that part of your heart that cannot be stilled until it is satisfied. A favorite hymn notes that we are prone to wander from God. We long for the connection with the divine, that divine tether that unites us with one another and with our Creator. When life becomes burdensome, we thirst after love. And life indeed can become overwhelming at times, whether or not of our own making, Problems come to each life. Sometimes, like Elijah fighting off the worshipers of Baal, we are strong and able to work through them. And sometimes, like Elijah and the man who lived in the cemetery, we need help. We cannot handle life alone. Nor are we meant to. The one who created us and loves us completely does not leave us to fight or cry or suffer alone. Biblical scholar Jeffrey Johns writes of our story from Luke. The miracle story is not just about a personal exorcism. It is about the promise of God's ability to defeat and reorder the disordered powers that afflict individuals and communities. In other words, this story is about human suffering and divine power that allows us to survive and even thrive. In the book, Brain on Fire, Susan Callahan chronicles her experience with mental illness, and many of her symptoms resemble those historically associated with demon possession. This excerpt comes from an NPR interview. She said, I don't remember anything from this experience all had to be told to me after the fact. My boyfriend heard guttural sounds coming from me. The grunts were very unnatural sounding, so he turned and looked at me, and he saw that my eyes were wide open, 
but completely unseen. At that point, my arms whipped out and I had a grand mal seizure, seizure and I was convulsing. I bit my tongue so hard that blood and a kind of combination of blood and foam was coming from my mouth. I slurred my words, I drooled. Her story is one of many found on the internet connecting an ancient understanding of demon possession with severe mental illness. In her case, she was finally diagnosed with a rare autoimmune disease that can attack the brain. Helen says, doctors think the illness may account for cases of demonic possession throughout history. This story today speaks of suffering, deep suffering. This man suffered mightily. He must have had times of being in his right mind before this. Like so many suffering with mental illness, he must have had periods when he was seemingly balanced, functioning, had clear thoughts. He must have had friends and family early in his life who interacted with him. There must have been some sense of normalcy before these demons took up residence in his soul. And if so, did they sit on edge waiting for the behavior to take it to the inevitable turn? And what about those family members? And those friends, they suffered too. What about all the people who cared for this demoniac over his lifetime? Who was his mother? Did she have to send him to live in the tombs, or did he run away? Who fed him? Did people from the village bring him food from time to time? Did they? Did they leave it for him at a safe distance? Or were there people he trusted to come near? Did he have any friends at all? Suffering abounds. And it can stick to us if we let it. Sometimes we need a snack and a good nap like Elijah. Sometimes we need the stillness of the Psalms to remind us that we are never alone. And sometimes we need to name our demons and be willing to let them go. Have you ever wondered why someone chooses to remain stuck rather than learn to move on? Have you ever wondered that about yourself? Sometimes, perhaps, all of us choose to continue to wrestle with the demons we know, as opposed to letting them go, driving them out of our lives in fear that something worse might replace them. And in our fear of the unknown, we lock ourselves inside a graveyard dwelling there with those voices in our heads that tell us that we're crazy, or that we're stupid, or unattractive, or not good enough. We do that not willing to allow for the possibility that we have the power all along to drive out those demons in our lives in the name of Jesus Christ. When we refuse to move on, to chase the old, outweigh the old, when we choose to remain stuck where we are, we suffer as to our loved ones. Sometimes we cannot see that we have a choice. Yet the one who created us longs for us to see that he has given us choices. 
and that he will be there in the making of those choices. In The Little Monk and the Samurai, a Zen parable, a big, tough samurai once went to see a little monk. Monk, he barked, in a voice accustomed to instant obedience. Teach me about heaven and hell. The monk looked up at the mighty warrior and replied with utter disdain. Teach you about heaven and hell? I couldn't teach you about anything. You're dumb. You're dirty. You're a disgrace and embarrassment to the samurai class. Get out of my sight. I can't stand you. The samurai got furious. He shook, red in the face, speechless with rage. He pulled out his sword and prepared to slay the monk. Looking straight into the samurai's eyes, the monk said slowly, That is how. The samurai froze, realizing the compassion of the monk who had risked his own life to show him how. He put down his sword, he fell on his knees, filled with gratitude to the monk. And the monk said softly, and that is how. Friends, there are, is deep suffering in our world and there is deep suffering in our own lives. Some of it is beyond our control, but a lot of it isn't. How we respond to suffering is our choice. We have great knowledge to help us with mental, spiritual, and physical suffering. Right here in Stowe, Ohio, we are blessed to have places to help us, clinics, and support groups, and food pantries, and caring communities of people who genuinely love one another and will do all they can to help the other. As United Methodists, we are part of a worldwide community of people who care about others. There is strength in this community, for we are able to equip people to reach out to others who are in need when we cannot go to them. Our missional outreach is able to grow when we work together. Most of all, my friends, we are blessed to know the power of love at work in our lives. Something we can all do is share that love with others. As a philosopher once said, why are we here if not to make life a little easier for each other? We cannot cure every illness. We cannot fix every problem. We cannot guarantee that there won't be more suffering in someone's life. Sometimes all we can do is be present with one another and hold a space for the divine in our lives and in theirs. And perhaps that will always be enough.